Good morning, everybody. Morning. Morning. Good morning. Okay, uh, we obviously have a lot to get through, uh, but I just want to take a few minutes off the top here, obviously, to make a, a couple of comments. Hopefully, um, hopefully you have seen uh, my thoughts, uh, which I, I sent out uh, about an hour ago. Um, thanking uh, everybody uh, in this organization for what uh, what happened through the last week. Uh, as I said in that, I could not be prouder. And uh, the entire world uh, uh, relied on CNN and, uh, and everyone in this organization delivered. Um, there are a couple of people uh, in addition who wanted me to uh, extend some thoughts, and so I'm going to take a couple. I'm going to take a minute or two here off the top, uh, just to just to share some thoughts from some folks who asked me to do this. Um, the first is a, uh, a quick note from Ted Turner, uh, who wrote, uh, "Congratulations on CNN's magnificent coverage of the 2020 election. I thought the team did a great job." and I was very proud of them. I would be grateful if you could share my feedback with everyone involved. Most sincerely, Ted Turner. Uh, and I wanted to share uh, at his request the following thoughts from John Stenke, who everybody knows is the CEO of AT&T. Jeff, please extend my thanks, appreciation, and congratulations to the entire CNN team for a fantastic election week. Let's hope the week part doesn't become a thing going forward, but it was truly a full and, ch and challenging week. As I have shared with you, I am drained and I was only watching. I know a week does not an election cycle make, but it sure was a notable capstone to what has been an extend extended team effort. It probably does not surprise anyone that I am a bit of a message board for CNN feedback. Last week was one of those weeks where everyone had something positive and supportive to say. The news and stories will not stop, but it is certainly appropriate to pause, take a deep breath, and acknowledge all the hard work that got you to this moment. Production quality was superior to the competitive set at every level. The commentary on air chemistry and coordination was some of the best I can ever remember. The discipline in the messaging and tone was notable, constructive and professional exchanges and repartee appropriately framed context and issues. The entire five days came off like a well-synchronized machine. Everyone in front and behind the camera should take a bow and be proud. The job was very well done and once again demonstrated why CNN is in a class by itself. Sincerely, John. So uh, both of both Ted Turner and John Stanky asked me to share that with the entire organization, and, and so I hope uh, everyone takes to heart uh, those notes and those thoughts. And obviously, I don't think there's much that I can add <clears throat> to that, uh, except, um, as you know, uh, I've said all along that this is an incredible team effort, and, uh, and as a result, I've been very reluctant to single uh, anyone out because there is no one person uh, who's responsible for this. Having said that, there are two uh, there are two people who I do want to note, uh, and the first is Eric Sherling uh, for his incredible uh, leadership in planning all of our election programming and coverage. Uh, we uh, were on the air live last week for 177 straight hours, and uh, that, uh, that, and as Ted and John noted, uh, none of that would have been as superb without Eric's direction and leadership, and, uh, and obviously his entire team behind him. But I want to say thank you to Eric. I also want to note uh, David Chalian and the entire political team that uh, has covered this story for uh, years and came together last week in, a, in an uh, incredible way. Uh, the political team at CNN uh, shines like no other, and, uh, and I want to say thank you to David and the incredible team 
behind him. Um, and obviously, uh, uh, the people who brought us this story uh, on the air um, were were just superb. And again, at the risk of singling anyone out, uh, I just would make a couple of notes. Uh, it is clear that obviously Wolf Witzer informed the world uh, of the news. Uh, and I would just note that uh, of the 177 hours we were on last week, uh, Anderson Cooper uh, anchored 70, was on for 71 of those hours, uh, John King for 54 of those hours, and Wolf, Jake, Dana, and Abby for 52 of those hours. Uh, an incredible, uh, incredible run. Um, so obviously now, uh, um, I uh, um, uh, want to also uh, turn to where we are now in the in the story, um, and obviously uh, the calling of this election and the calling of the races uh, has been an incredible storyline. And I should note there the uh, terrific work uh, and leadership uh, of our decision desk. Uh, and Jenna Jesta and her team, and um, and obviously at the center of all of that is Sam Feist and uh, and his leadership. And so, thank you to them. So as we move on now and look ahead, um, I really do believe that there are four major overall storylines for us to uh, take note of. Um, and uh, I'll turn it over to the team to, to run through this, but but uh, clearly in my mind from here through January, uh, obviously the unforeseen will come up, but but there will be, in my mind, four major storylines for us to, to follow. Obviously, the first will be the Biden transition and the Biden administration. Um, we will also have uh, – uh, this is the beginning of the post-Trump era and uh, around the world um, and here at home, Trump is, is starting to be seen uh, uh, in the rear view mirror, but that does not mean that he's not a storyline. And uh, the Trump story, the Trump lack of concession, the misinformation, the inevitable coming pardons, his final 70 days, what he will do and his legal woes will be a second storyline. Georgia will be on our mind. The two Senate races for control of the Senate is the third major storyline. Uh, and then obviously the fourth, uh, and we see the major news today, um, will be coronavirus uh, with cases on the rise everywhere, uh, but uh, this incredibly hopeful news uh, of a vaccine, uh, a successful vaccine on the horizon, I think is the fourth storyline. Biden. Trump, Georgia, and COVID, to me, are the four major storylines as we move forward. Let us begin uh, with today's report, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, David Challenger first. Uh, good morning, Jeff. Um, thank you for that. Uh, so, as you noted, uh, the Biden transition is uh, certainly uh, underway uh, in earnest today. You heard the president-elect on Saturday night in Wilmington uh, say that priority one is getting control of the virus. Uh, with that, his uh, COVID task force uh, meets today, briefs the president and vice president-elect um, uh, in the uh, next hour, and then we expect uh, remarks from the president-elect around 11.30ish this morning. That's for planning only, not reporting. But that could slip to early afternoon. But we're we're sort of tracking uh, 11:30 a.m. remarks uh, for planning at the moment. Uh, the briefings uh, that they're going to get are both COVID-related and uh, economic fallout from COVID-related. Uh, and as you know, uh, the mission of this COVID task force now is to take what was a campaign plan and actually operationalize it into uh, a government plan. Um, you know, former Surgeon General Vivek Murthy is uh, part of the co-chairs here. Uh, Rick Bright, the uh, whistleblower, is uh, in this group. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, just from the personnel of the group itself, the contrast is clear from the current administration, and obviously so too will be uh, the, the uh, executable plan here. Um, 
In addition to COVID, uh, you saw reporting from our team over the weekend about sort of going back and looking at all the executive actions and uh, authority that Biden throughout the campaign sort of uh, foreshadowed that he could uh, roll out uh, from the get-go uh, as soon as he uh, was sworn in from climate change to DACA and others. So uh, the team will continue uh, to keep tabs on uh, those uh, developments uh, as well, uh, planning to, to roll out those executive actions. But but again, uh, Biden made clear uh, getting control of the virus is, is everything at the front, front end of this. Um, you noted um, some world leaders already putting uh, – President Trump in the rearview mirror, uh, Biden continues to receive uh, congratulatory messages uh, from uh, leaders um, around the entire globe. So uh, uh, that continues to pour in uh, as well. Um, we do not anticipate uh, sort of senior staff, West Wing style announcements, perhaps until a few days from now, maybe later in the week. We'll get a little more on that. But the uh, the reporting team will uh, stay on that as well. Um, the uh, just so folks know, the correspondent uh, plan today. We had Jessica Dean up this morning throughout the day, and then uh, Arla Sainz and Jeff Zeleny uh, take over this afternoon in alternating hours from uh, Wilmington. Uh, the votes continue to be counted, obviously, um, and uh, we can uh, continue to update those uh, vote boards for people, especially on the you know uncalled races in. Uh, uh, Arizona uh, and Georgia, uh, North Carolina, um, and uh, and obviously you see um, Joe Biden's in lead in Pennsylvania, the state that put him over the top, uh, continues to to grow as uh, more vote comes in there as well. Uh, so uh, the team will uh, be able to continue to uh, put out updates for folks to see that vote count rolling in. Uh, also, I should just note with that. Um, because I know sort of post-election, everyone's going to dive a little deeper than they had time to last week into the exit polls. And I just want to remind folks, like I say on air on election night, you know, those those initial exit polls, uh, we always know change because they get weighted to the real vote as it comes in. And as the real vote has taken a long time to come in because of the two-thirds of, of the electorate that voted uh, prior to election day and those votes uh, by mail getting counted still um, – the national election pool, the consortium that had added some research that runs the exit poll for us, uh, will end up uh, updating those exit polls we expect today. Um, and you'll see the numbers will shift, and in some places significantly so, as the exit poll gets rated, weighted to real votes. So Jen will send out a note for folks to know uh, when that's done uh, in case anybody is digging into that stuff. Um, you noted uh, that uh, there are two runoff races in Georgia set for January 5th, and control of the United States Senate hangs in the balance. Um, John Ossoff, you saw a new day this morning with John Berman, and you heard him make it all about the immediate needs of uh, getting the virus under control and then therefore being able to rebuild the economy. Um, this was not, uh, you know, uh, he was not offering some laundry list of uh, um, progressive ideals to make sure Democrats are in charge. It was all focused on uh, the incompetence, uh, as Ossoff says it, of the way that the virus has been handled and that that needs to be turned around for the immediate needs of Georgians and the country overall. Uh, it all ma matches up exactly with what he's been campaigning on all year and his first uh, runoff campaign ad out of the gate, um, and he was asked if he would welcome Vice President, uh, President-elect Biden uh, to Georgia to campaign. He said he certainly would, um, should should he have time or inclination to do so. So there was no uh, fear, obviously, in, in a state that Biden just turned blue this election season, uh, however narrowly, of, of welcoming um, Biden to the state uh, for the campaign, but clearly wanting to avoid just a full-out um, sort of partisan uh, D versus R control of the Senate kind of framing around this and, and keeping COVID front and center. I know Virginia's going to have a, a ton on the um, uh, transition from the current government side and the Trump administration side. I'll just want to note a couple things. I, I know we did it all day yesterday. I, I still think 
that George W. Bush statement was pretty extraordinary, um, A, just because obviously the only living uh, former Republican president, but but less about what it does to move McConnell or McCarthy or others, I, I don't know, but more the signal, again, it's sent to the world leaders, it's sent to voters across the country, the commitment to democracy, um, and from a guy who has so um, – Diligently and determined, and determined to stay on the sidelines, uh, you know, uh, to to issue that statement. I just think it's it was really well crafted, and um, and I I think it's uh, just worth um, in uh, continued sort of noting of it uh, because of uh, just how how important that statement was from from him in particular. Um, again, I don't I, I, not having anything to do with his ability to sway current Republicans. I think it's quite clear this is the Trump Republican Party, and it's been clear uh, for five years. Um, and uh, and then I, uh, the the GSA stuff. I think Virginia will warn about this ascertainment, but it does really trip up uh, the Biden transition uh, in pretty significant ways. Um, and I think that's where we start. Okay. Thank you, David. Uh, Virginia. Okay, so as um, David David mentioned the George Bush statement, so there's that. Then, then we have um, Trump and all these legal challenges that he obviously is continuing to say. Um, he knows that um, there has been absolutely no widespread merit to any of them, but that does not seem that is not stopping him. Um, there's also this um, reporting that our team had last night about the talk that Trump. Um, or his team will have rallies focusing on litigation and obituaries of people who are recorded as voting but are dead. Um, and Kushner playing both sides of the aisle, um, railing again on, on the one side, pushing him forward to do that, on the other, urging him to concede. Um, as David mentioned, none of this really matters except to his supporters, except for this real concern, which is about the GSA. Um, Kristen Holmes will pick up this piece of the story. But um, the transition itself continues on the GSA giving the go-ahead to um, to be able to start this transition. This involves money, landing teams, and the Trump appointee in charge of the GSA um, has made it very clear that they will wait until, quote, a winner is clear. So um, uh, how that unfolds is really, aside from the, the talk, um, is, the, is the important thing with the consequences. Um, on the Republicans, we did talk a little bit about, um, important to note that more than 24 hours after the, the election was actually called, the vast majority of Republicans have declined to offer this customary statement of goodwill that normally is done. And then just to um, note that uh, Richard will have more on this stop the steal and the feeling from Trump supporters that this election was stolen because that's what Trump keeps saying. On the Trump and COVID, obviously the markets are up huge. Trump's up this morning tweeting about it. Um, Donald Trump Jr. questioning the timing of this. Um, this is Meadows. Um, the maskless around uh, was a, it was announced that he had COVID over the over the weekend. Um, in terms of his condition, he's working from home with mild symptoms. The only other two things I want to mention out of here is um, on SCOTUS today we could have orders which could include the Pennsylvania ruling. There are not a number, to our knowledge, a number of enough votes in question for this to make any difference, but it'll just be interesting to see how it handles. And then obviously the all important ACA is being argued before the Supreme Court tomorrow. So as we look ahead to that, and that's what I got. Okay, thank you. Obviously uh, ma major news of the day is gonna come in the COVID side. Uh, and we'll get to Matthew with that in a moment. But let me open it up to thoughts on uh, Biden, Trump, election, transition, Georgia Senate race, anybody, anything anybody wants to bring up? Jeff, the president's refusal to concede isn't just about him being a sore loser, which he is quickly becoming. Um, it has real impact on life and death issues until he concedes. Uh, the incoming Biden team can't begin the long process of getting security clearances, which is critical to protecting national security. And 
perhaps more importantly right now, they can't begin the coordination on things like vaccine distribution. And if that coordination doesn't go well, it could cost tens of thousands of lives. So this sore loser issue that we're dealing with with, uh, with Donald Trump is actually going to impact or could impact the country dramatically. Uh, so it's not just a political issue. It's, 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 a, it's an actual impact issue. Adding to what okay. Sam said, I remember the um, when the 9-11 Commission report came out, when the Republicans made a big deal out of the fact that uh, it's sort of like the report pointed out that national security planning suffered during the transition because of the court battle and people not cooperating with each other. And so I just wondered if there's a net security story out there about whether or not the things are happening that are supposed to be happening, whether people are getting briefed, all of those things. Hey, Jeff, I, I would be very, I, I'm very concerned about the, the, the fact, and I saw Donnie O'Sullivan's um, story yesterday about the social media rejection issue that people are facing. But I think that there's a, a deeper issue here because these people are armed. And I think that a lot of people are very nervous about people showing up with AK-47 um, and, and more and more aggressively challenging the uh, results of the election. And if there are going to be rallies everywhere, um, we're talking about, you know, 70 million people. And, and the social media is not stopping. They have, you know, I, I, have, I just saw a bunch of people saying we're leaving Facebook and going to Parlay, which is the, the alternative that doesn't block people. I think the social media story is really dangerous. The fact that these are unregulated voices that can just say whatever they want and, and that lack of regulation allows for this to just rampant craziness to go on. And, and I, I think that story requires a deeper dive. Look, I think this information, as I mentioned earlier, I think is going to be a big part uh, of the story going forward. Donnie's uh, story this weekend, and I think you'll see it again this morning, uh, was another uh, really strong reported example of what we're dealing with. And I think that we're going to have to uh, cover that in a significant way going forward. And uh, no question about it. Other okay. thoughts? Anyone else? Anybody else with any thoughts on the election? Hey, Jeff. <clears throat> hey, Jeff. I, I would just yep. say one thing about the sort of the focus of our coverage, obviously the four stories you outlined, but I, I'm just thinking about this in the wake of what Sam said, which I agree with Jim is so important about, you know, how this will impact. But, but the one thing that we need to keep in mind is that, you know, in truth, Donald Trump is no longer entitled to script the storyline, and our normal approach to where we would be right now would be, like you were saying, Biden transition at the top. But just make sure that we're thinking in those terms, in terms of what, who's, you know, what are his actions going to be at the start of his administration? We've already had reporting about executive orders and other things. Who's going to be Secretary of State? Who's going to be Secretary of Defense? All of the normal things that we would be doing in a normal situation to push the story forward as it's going to ultimately be. And while we've had incredible reporting out of the White House on what Trump is thinking and saying and incredible reporting on, you know, these, this, what their plan may be in terms of the rallies and other things, you know, it, I mean, everybody has done a terrific job of illuminating all of those things. And we've done an amazing fact check on a lot of the conspiracy theories about voting and, you know, burning bags of ballots. And, and Donnie had that in his, in his piece, as you said, that was so well done. That's not true. Those are sample ballots. That's fake video, et cetera, whatever it is. But we need to move past a lot of that stuff and not amplify this fake noise about conspiracy theories too much and try to treat some of this, not, I mean, it isn't normal, I understand that, but the things that we would regularly be doing in the wake of a change in power in the White House, 
Um, it's somewhat blocked a little bit by this GSA issue, which I think we should be calling out as often as we can as being, you know, basically a political appointee blocking what should be happening. But I do think we have to function in some sense within the way we would normally do it when there's a new president coming in. You know, we did it when President Trump beat Hillary Clinton. We went, we were Bedminster watching him talk to Rudy Giuliani and all these people about the various jobs in the administration. And so we really need to make sure that we're pursuing our own script and not in any way, shape, or form being dictated by, I understand the craziness is interesting and it's a catchy tease and all that stuff, but we need to also start the process toward normal, right? I mean, I really believe that that's important for not only us and our and our work, but also for the country at large. And, and uh, you know, we can't, President Trump has been running a reality show for four or five years now. That's fine. He had his time. But that's over now. And we can't let them script the story going forward and get caught up in stuff that's really not important. Okay, so I think that I think that's a good transition to uh, what I do think is the story of uh, the transition today. Again, as I noted earlier, today is really the beginning of the post-Trump era, uh, as Michael was saying, uh, you know, in most uh, rational places here in the United States and around the world, Trump is being uh, left in the rearview mirror. And the transition today is to how the Biden administration is going to handle COVID and, uh, and all of the announcements that are going to come out today from the Biden team about uh, adv their, who's advising them on COVID and how they're dealing with that and the news out of Pfizer on COVID. So let's look forward and uh, turn it over to Matthew. Thanks, Jeff. So the most significant vaccine news yet on the day that we are set to hit 10 million cases. Uh, Pfizer announcing this morning that early data shows its vaccine is more than 90% effective. That's after two shots in 28 days. Pfizer intends to go to the FDA in roughly two weeks after a little more required safety monitoring. A little context here on more than 90% effective. Fauci tells CNN this morning this is extraordinarily good news. Uh, remember, in a good year, a flu vaccine is about 60% effective, and we've heard experts on COVID managing expectations for months talking about maybe a 50 to 75% effective vaccine. So obviously 90 plus is way better than expected. Pfizer CEO uh, telling Sanjay this morning how long this protection lasts is something we don't know. So he says this could be a yearly or seasonal shot, much more data to come. He says millions of doses already manufactured over a billion next year. Not to be forgotten, of course, uh, we are in for 10 weeks of terrifying surge between now and the inauguration. And then, of course, after that, before wide vaccine distribution, uh, while America was focused on election week in the past week, we've added three quarters of a million cases in that period. Five days, over 100,000 cases. And for the first time, the average of new cases is over 100,000 a day. And we're back to averaging, sadly, near 1,000 deaths a day and hospitalizations are on track to su surpass the spring and summer peaks for an all-time high. Perhaps this week, Gottlieb predicting this weekend that cases are going to explode in the coming weeks. Uh, this may be why uh, the U.S. positivity rate, which is always the leadingest of the indicators, uh, is now over 8% on average over the past week, the highest in many months. Gottlieb pointing out that Biden will take office at the apex uh, of the pandemic, and of course, we're in for many weeks uh, of what has recently been a pretty absent federal response, but of course, there's the Pence Task Force uh, meeting this afternoon. So in terms of the public health lines that connect to the Biden transition plan, um, mobilizing testing in a big way is the top item on that seven-point plan, and the numbers certainly suggest why. You'll remember that the experts have been saying since the spring that we probably should be testing up to five million people a day. Uh, over the past few months, as we've gotten all these announcements of testing surges, uh, the average daily test numbers have gone up only a little, from about a million uh, to 
3 uh, million daily on average. Obviously, the names on Biden's list signal uh, the shift toward the medical experts. Uh, and then on Biden's uh, aspirational mask mandate from every governor that he's going to talk to them about, uh, it looks like there still are about 17 states without mandates, including some very hot zone states uh, like Florida, uh, Iowa, Idaho, Missouri, and Georgia. The NCC putting out an updated list, and I know Digital's working on that separate. Uh, and then in terms of the key regions, on the CNN map, no state heading in the right direction. Uh, they are all red and rising or steady, but of course steady after surging for weeks. There are 10 states in that very deep red category, weekly increases over 50%. Oregon's governor uh, has a simple message about this alarming threshold, she says, quote, cancel your social plans, wear a mask, get a flu shot, and wash your hands. Utah's governor, uh, who had been resisting a mask mandate for months, uh, issued a mandate last night, declared a state of emergency, says we must do more, citing hospital overcrowding and desperate pleas uh, from doctors and nurses. Illinois reported its third consecutive day over 10,000 cases in that state alone, and we've got Adrian up in Chicago, and New Jersey's governor suggesting this morning that an announcement could be coming later today on some new restrictions. A little more uh, from the health headlines and on the vaccine news and more. Sounds ironic, but this is how it works. Fauci pointing out to Sanjay, Pfizer got results so quickly because there is so much spread around. That is simply how you test. You allow people to be infected. Um, we expect announcements from other companies, likely Moderna next in the coming days and weeks. Of course, releasing a vaccine is one thing. Convincing everyone to take it is another. Uh, a top Warp Speed official told 60 Minutes this weekend that its biggest fear is people refusing to be vaccinated, and couple that with this study uh, in the journal Pediatrics. One in six U.S. parents are vaccine hesitant. Their children less likely to get a flu shot, so that does not bode well uh, on this front. We'll also get some key studies from JAMA Internal Medicine today at 11 o'clock on the risk of severe COVID among essential workers and their families, and on the link uh, between nursing home crowding uh, and cases and deaths as nursing home surges are way higher than everywhere else at this point. Uh, and then just a few notes uh, as we continue to talk about the long lasting impacts, the long haul of COVID. Uh, Fauci this weekend saying there definitely is a quote, post COVID-19 syndrome, 25 to 35% of people with lingering symptoms, fatigue, shortness of breath, brain fog, uh, an Oxford study coming out that 20% of COVID patients receive a psychiatric dosis, uh, diagnosis uh, within 90 days. So the long-term effects here. Sanjay is available all day. Uh, and then Elizabeth Cohen and Jacqueline Howard also available from help. Uh, and we've got uh, uh, back to the two rap pieces today. Nick Lott for 3579, Athena Jones for 4, 6, 8, and 10. And that's it. I want to suggest to uh, all of our shows that uh, the COVID rap pieces are really important right now with everything that's going on. And uh, I really want to make sure that we are uh, all over that. Uh, okay, does anybody th have anything on COVID they want to bring up? Hi, Jeff, it's Liza. I just have one thought, which is in the Times, they talk about how Pfizer did not take any warp speed money for research and development, and they imply that they're alone among all of the leading drug companies that have been doing trials. If that's so, then I just think it's an important fact for when Donald Trump takes credit for this great success. Okay. And I can imagine that there's probably, yeah, I was just gonna, I was just going to follow up and say I can imagine that there's going to be some sort of conspiracy theory about this. Like, why did they come out, you know, a week after the election um, as opposed to last week? I mean, I can definitely see that coming. So, good morning, well, Ben. So just has, Don, Don Jr. Jr. is already out with that conspiracy theory. Go ahead, Ben. I was just going to add to uh, both of those things really quickly. Uh, the Pfizer CEO, Albert Bourla, telling Sanjay this morning that they found out about these results yesterday afternoon, so in, in answer to the you know election timeline question. And then um, we're working with Daniel Dale on a fact check about the pet claims of credit for the Pfizer vaccine. Um, Pfizer did get almost $2 billion from the federal government for the manufacturing of it, which is payment ahead of time, but they are not part of the vaccine development 
Umbrella, Pfizer doing their own testing, their own distribution. So, yes, they receive money from manufacturer, but, you know, as, as with many things, it's a, it's a bit of a gray, murky area, but we'll work with Daniel to nail that down. Anyone else? Okay, is there anything else out of domestic? Just tropical storm Ada, which could become Hurricane Ada again as it threatens Florida's west coast. A lot of flash flooding over southeast Florida right now. Some roads impassable, schools closed. Um, uh, could, could could threaten it with hurricane status Florida's west coast later this week. And we're handling this from the Weather Center with Chad and Tom flooding the day. And that's really it. Thank you. Uh, international. Um, morning. Um, so we are obviously completely focused on the election um, and also COVID. Uh, the international reaction is a really um, important angle today, um, notably who has congratulated Biden and also equally important who hasn't. Um, we're going to be looking at that. We're going to be looking at these international relationships, what will change under Biden and the deals, the relationships that have ended, weakened, strengthened in the Trump era. How will that move forward? So Christian Anandpour is available to kind of give the overarching theme, also Nick Robertson as well. And then beyond that, we jump into the individual datelines. Um, in terms of the countries who have not come out and congratulated him, no great surprise that China is kind of sidestepping the issue for now, um, saying that it wants to wait for the legal process to play out. The big question there, what happens with the trade deal? Um, Russia um, very much reacting alongside its home audience. You know, we can't forget how popular Trump was there among um, the Russians as well, um, saying that they're going to wait for official um, results before con congratulating the winner. Um, Matthew Chance is on that. Um, Iran is in, interesting. What will happen with a nuclear deal? Will Biden return? Nick Payton Walsh is focused on that angle. Um, and then North Korea, South Korea. North Korea so far has said nothing. Um, South Korea is saying that they continue to um, show allegiance to the U.S. They don't want a, Obama style of handling the situation, and, and they're going to work with Trump to the end. Um, Paula Hancock handled that story. Um, and then just other countries like um, Bolsonaro, Mexico, you know, none of them um, standing up and congratulating yet. Um, Saudi and Israel are interesting. Saudi just actually congratulated Biden, um, but obviously um, it's, they're having to kind of walk a fine line there with Netanyahu congratulating Biden, Biden while thanking Trump. But then overwhelming support and warmth from the allies. That notable, most notable is Merkel, who said, you know, let's stand together and master the challenges of our time. Fred Pleiken is on that, and Melissa Bell hang, handles the whole question of what happens with the climate agreement. So we're really, really well covered, and we'll continue to watch all those um, international um, reaction come through. And then COVID, huge story for us as well with Pfizer. Um, and also just, we, you know, whilst we've all been watching the election, what's been happening with COVID around the world, now past 50 million, um, we've got a rap piece out of Europe from Scott McLean and a rap piece out of Asia um, by Selena Wang. Um, so that's it for us. Thank you very much, Mira. Business. Jeff, good morning. U.S. futures surging this morning on the Pfizer news. Uh, Dow futures are up. Uh, I'm sorry, not Dow futures. The Dow did open uh, up more than 1,600 points. The Russell 2000 uh, hit its limit up. That was a circuit breaker this morning. And big companies and corporations are, are benefiting this morning. Companies that have been most exposed to uh, COVID-19 airlines like American are up 15%. Disney, which was facing a potential revenue loss of $2 billion, that stock is up 15%. And, of course, movie theater stocks like AMC going gangbusters, uh, AMC up a whopping 80% in pre-market trading. But as Frank Pallotta noted this morning, uh, even if there is an effective vaccine in the future, will audiences return to movie theaters? So we have a, a, a large uh, group up and available on that. Christine Romans uh, is up from New York, and Allison Kosick is up at the New York Stock Exchange tracking the markets throughout the day. Um, of course, uh, as you mentioned, Jeff, last week, part of what is driving the U.S. market is also this investor solid and the idea of a divided government. And analysts told me this morning that perhaps a uh, Republican Senate will force Biden into more moderate nominees. Matt Egan's done reporting on how there's fears of an Elizabeth Warren at the Treasury Department. Uh, and of course, as most uh, Americans do not have, uh, uh, aside from 401ks, do not play into the stock market, uh, the labor market continues to be under pressure. Friday's jobs report came in better than expected, but that said, still over 10 million Americans out of work right now. And the question, obviously, 
actually is, is there going to be political will in this lame duck session for any sort of stimulus deal? Uh, so we have, uh, we are up on that as well. Of course, we mentioned Doni's fantastic piece over the weekend on how disinformation continues to run rampant, especially amongst uh, the president's supporters. Uh, you know, he uh, pointed out that, uh, you know, a lot of his supporters are talking about a rigged election, including that video that purportedly showed ballots uh, being burned. That was shared by Eric Trump. But of course, of course, as Tony pointed out, that video was false. Uh, so Tony is up and available on that piece this morning. And lastly, in media, the pro-Trump media outlets like Fox News and some of their biggest stars enabling what Brian Stelter has termed Trump's last stand, creating content for this alternative reality where Biden is not the president-elect and where Democratic voter fraud is rampant. Uh, so we have Oliver and Brian up, uh, both up and available on that uh, as well. And that's where we begin. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Washington, anything else out of Washington? Nothing from me. Okay, so before we move to digital, is there anything else anybody wants to bring up? Anyone else? The response, oh, one thing, Jeff, from Rick. Um, the response from Biden and Trump regarding the news from Pfizer. Um, Biden urges caution and reiterates the need to follow all the protocols because this will not happen right away. Trump tweets about the news and cites the stock market. And I just think that there might be something that uh, shows just might want to compare and contrast um, because it does it is kind of symbolic about how both of them dealt with this issue and maybe even had something to do with the election result. And I just think that's striking and, and goes along with, you know, your top four, at least dealing with uh, the uh, three, three or four of them in terms of uh, melding them together. Yeah, I totally agree. I think, and I think that's what we should be doing. I agree with you. Anyone else? Jeff, it's Jamie. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, Jamie. I just want to underscore something that Michael said earlier about the transition and Trump, because I've been talking to a lot of people this morning on both sides, and they, I just keep hearing the same thing, both from Republicans who have not come out to congratulate Biden, but uh, but also to those who have in the Democrats. And that is that we have to be, you know, news organizations have to be very careful and very responsible about not giving Trump too much of a platform on his not conceding because they feel the transition can go forward and you know, other than the national security briefings, which are critical to start now, uh, they just don't want us to exaggerate that Trump isn't leaving office. And I'm going to have a lot of specific reporting on that later today, but just big picture wanted to underscore what Michael had said. Yep. Agreed. Anybody else? Okay, so before I move to digital, again, I just want to, to all the television platforms in line with all of this, I want to stay newsy. I want to stay urgent. There's a lot going on. Uh, again, the big buckets, it's the Biden transition and administration uh, uh, is, is the big focus. Uh, and then... Obviously, there is a piece of, you know, uh, Trump uh, and the beginning of the end uh, around the world and here in the United States, Trump is being written off. Uh, uh, and then obviously, at some point, we'll deal with the coming pardons and his final 70 days and his legal woes. Georgia, the two Senate races for control of the Senate, so critical. Coronavirus cases on the rise but a vaccine on the horizon. Uh, those are the four major buckets. Obviously, there are others, but those are the major ones. 
stay newsy and urgent. We don't need to go soft. We don't need to go featurey. There's a ton going on, and let's let's stay stay that way. Let's move uh, now, please, to digital. Hey, so Jay Z, as you said in your note, we notched five of the six biggest days of all time. Uh, yesterday was not in that group. Yesterday was 48.7 million uniques. So that's number 23 of all time. Uh, so still not bad. We'll take it. This morning, there are two things that are basically tied for number one. They're both uh, about to hit 20,000 concurrence. Uh, the first is the results map. People are still on it. It's remarkable. Um, um, it's just it, they're spending a lot of time. They're clicking around. They're obviously looking at Georgia and Arizona. So audiences are still with the data and the numbers. And we have paired with it a really nice interactive on Biden's win was more decisive than you may think, how the electoral map changed between 2016 and 2020 and what that means for the country. So that's kind of the first thing at the top of the list. And the second thing is Collinson's extra sharp analysis. Trump is in denial as Biden gears up to fight COVID. Uh, we've got uh, Kushner and Melania advising Trump to accept his loss in the top five. We've got the Biden transition team announcing uh, the COVID advisors, including whistleblower Rick Bright, and we've got the Pfizer vaccine story in the top five. So very newsy top five. Um, there's just too many stories on Smolkin's incredible rundown uh, to cite, but I do want to point out a couple. Um, this, this piece that went up from LipTech, yesterday inside trump's loss a culmination of self-destructive decisions that piece was getting like 30,000 concurrence for hours yesterday and it still has a more than two and a half minute engagement time people are spending a ton of time on that story um we've got other like just good uh, standalone pieces like frederica scouton on the aka sisters basking in kamala harris's victory um just excellent lineup uh, over in business, the results are in the stock market likes Joe Biden. That's really nice analysis. Mira mentioned the international leader reaction. We've got a piece on why Putin, Xi, Bolsonaro, and Erdogan have not congratulated Biden. Another strong piece, there's no such thing as the Latino vote. We've talked about this uh, in this meeting and over email. Um, this is from Nicole Chavez with the original video from Gabe Ramirez and Madeline Six. The Latino vote is just not a monolith, and the 2020 results reveal a complex electorate. Super smart. More to come on that, but that is a great start. We've got pieces on Georgia, including the impact of Stacey Abrams and how John Lewis's legacy showed up at the polls. We've got some really good features pieces on how to navigate the coming weeks with grace and uh, a style piece on why Kamala Harris's white suit spoke volumes. Over an opinion, we have 25 commentators talking about what's next for America. Those opinion roundups are always very popular with users. And I should note, Van Jones's powerful emotional moment broke all records on social for us. Just uh, remarkable. Uh, so still a lot of conversation on that too. Uh, we asked audiences to call or write us to share how they were feeling. We put this up uh, right after we called it. Um, we have received so far 40,000 written messages from people and more coming in. And we've received uh, more than 1,500 voicemails from people and more are coming in. We've got a version one of that story up where you can uh, listen and read uh, what people are feeling. And there's a real broad range and mix. And it's just wonderful. And it's great material, by the way, for other stories across the entire network. Um, so it's just, just great. And then um, that's really it. I mean, listen, obviously we're on ADA and uh, we've got a really good package of stories around Alex Trebek. We should just mention that, including how he supported Black Lives Matter, most powerful lines from his memoir, et cetera. Uh, but I'll stop there. That's it. Great. Thank you, Meredith. Look, I think uh, actually you raised something that I think is a good note for everybody. There's still a tremendous amount of interest in the results, uh, especially what's going on in Arizona and Georgia in particular. Let's not be afraid to use that and use the map and show what's going on. Uh, and uh, uh, that's people are still very, very interested in that. And then two more notes, and this goes, I think, to the overall uh, message that we've been talking about. You know, let's make sure our focus is on Joe Biden, and he's about to be the next president, and, and what he's doing and how he's behaving and what what his plans are. And let's let's also remember 
uh, you know, and it'll be a big storyline over the next few months. Uh, the just tremendous importance and significance uh, of of uh, Kamala Harris and uh, and what she means to all of this. Okay, uh, John. Uh, good morning, Jeff. Uh, so right now, the um, the vaccine news from Pfizer is in the top spot. Elizabeth Cohen led the 9 a.m. Sanjay is um, uh, up next, uh, top of the 10 a.m. Uh, we'll continue to hit that hard. Uh, and what that means to the timeline of a, of, of a vaccine, potential timeline. Uh, and that dovetails into the Biden transition and big focus on um, COVID today. Jessica Dean and Jeff Zeleny in Wilmington. Um, the advisory board is meeting this morning. Uh, with all those players that we've detailed, um, Biden does make remarks um, later on this morning, uh, is what it sounds like. So we'll land on those when that happens. Sanjay will come back also uh, to be on, on the tail end of the um, the post of uh, whatever uh, Biden says uh, later today on um, on how he's going to help manage the uh, the COVID uh, crisis. Tom Inglesby, Dr. Leanna Wynn, um, Jorge Rodriguez uh, on just a new approach to managing the pandemic. Uh, and then we have uh, Romans, who is just up, and we'll get Chatterley up later on today, Julie Chatterley on the markets um, uh, just on fire uh, with the um, uh, vaccine news and um, the, uh, the Biden transition um, uh, details. Uh, John Harwood, Caitlin Collins, Pam Brown on the Trump angle, Kristen Holmes on the GSA, not releasing those funds um, that are so crucial to help uh, bring along a transition. Um, uh, Jamie Gengel is going to be joining us later on today uh, on the Brianna, um, during the Brianna hours with the news that she just talked about, Gloria Borger, Matt Weiser, Laura Baron lopez uh, the implications of not allowing the mechanics of a transition to kick in, uh, and then Ben Ginsburg and uh, Richard Kilby, uh, just a reality check on these, um, these legal maneuvers by the Trump team, um, Lieutenant Governor of Georgia on New Day this morning saying there are no example, credible examples of fraud. Uh, here in the state, we'll continue to hit that theme hard. Uh, Mark Preston and David Chalian uh, staying on the um, on the vote counts and, and the outstanding states as well as uh, those um, as well as Pennsylvania. Uh, John King will do his own magic wall version of that during his hours, uh, and then we are going to get into the Georgia Senate race throughout the day. Um, we do have uh, the main political reporter for the. Um, Atlanta Journal Constitution coming up next hour. Uh, we are doing uh, whips on world reaction. Nick Robertson, Fred Plaikin, Matthew Chance out of Moscow, MPW on um, Iran, uh, Antonio Sullivan, uh, and the social media misinformation storyline that's going to get on a couple of times today. Uh, back to coronavirus, we have the Nick Watt rat piece at three o'clock, um, uh, and we will be hitting some of these other storylines. Uh, the Illinois 10,000 cases, Adrian Broadus, Leona Rodriguez on the Notre Dame president um, admonishing the students uh, during the celebrations, even though he didn't follow his own advice and he was at the White House. And we'll see if we get those New, New Jersey restrictions back in place. If, and if so, we'll get a New York City reporter up around that. Okay. Thanks, John. Washington. Good morning. At, at 4 o'clock, we're covering all the urgent threads discussed. I've got a lead packaging on Biden and Harris, uh, Caitlin on the White House and Trump. Um, the transition, or, or lack thereof, uh, Kristen Holmes on the GSA, um, and of course the results still coming in, and Georgia Senate. Uh, Senator Chris Murphy among our guests, um, and with the Pfizer news, um, Athena Jones has our COVID wrap. We've got Sanjay's available, and also uh, Dr. James Phillips is booked, and we have asked for Julia Chatterley as well. Uh, and in the Situation Room, we'll be framing everything within these uh, four storylines mentioned, starting with the Biden transition uh, and the beginning of the post-Trump era. Uh, we'll watch Biden uh, this briefing uh, this morning um, uh, after his uh, task force meeting, those members being announced this morning. We'll see if we learn anything new about the executive actions that they say are to come. Um, we'll get into all of that with Arlette and Jeff Zeleny. Uh, all of this is it's the beginning of the end uh, for Trump. Uh, we'll watch to see what reporting comes out of the White House uh, today about how uh, Trump is proceeding. Uh, will he continue uh, to refuse to concede? Um, and we'll see, uh, uh, we'll follow the uh, GSA uh, storyline and the Kristen Holmes reporting. Um, we may also try to get some international whips in on the world reaction to Biden. Uh, we'll be continuing to track the state-by-state -state election updates with our map um, and follow on these two Senate races in Georgia as the Senate hangs in the ballot. Uh, and we'll obviously be following the huge surge in corona cases uh, with a possible uh, vaccine on the horizon and the Pfizer news. Uh, so we'll get into all of that with Sanjay, uh, and then we have our wrap pieces, and that's where we're starting. Okay, thank you, Emily. 
Does anybody have anything else they want to bring up? Hey, Jeff, it's David. I just think, um, you know, as a look ahead piece to consider post-election, reminding uh, ourselves that 2020 is also a census year and that the electoral map is going to look very different in 2024. The blue wall states will all lose votes. The southwest and southeastern states will all gain votes. Uh, based on the 270 mile, the same states would yield six fewer electoral votes for Biden in 2024. And I just think it makes for an interesting story about how the parties will compete in the upcoming cycles. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting story at some point. I think some analysis on that would be interesting at some point. Anyone else? Okay, uh, again, uh, congratulations and thank you to everybody uh, throughout the entire organization. Uh, it's been a remarkable week. Uh, part of what made it so special is that we really uh, stayed measured and calm and disciplined and played error-free ball. Uh, I really want to uh, continue to emphasize that as we go forward. There is so much news going on. Let's stay newsy and urgent, but let's put it all in context not over dramatize it stay disciplined stay focused stick to the facts and the news and uh and continue to play this error free ball thank you everybody have a very good day bye-bye